Hi, and welcome to Feet Gaming and an Age of Sigma discussion based on the new Lumineth Realm Lords Battle Tome. Now, I'm still working on my analysis of the units. I didn't actually receive the books until nearly a week after the release date. So uh, I'm going to confine myself to a general discussion about the new rules for Lumineth Realm Lords from the point of view of an opponent as something that was brought up on a forum. Uh, it's not a review, it's just adding my thoughts to it. Now, you know, I'd, I'd seen a few comments, as I say, from people describing the new units and rules as uh, tedious, was one word used, to play against. Now, I do have some sympathy for that point of view. Um, now, what I'm going to discuss isn't an objectively bad feature, by the way, but it is a feature where you can certainly have a debate. It is understandable that the army will garner some criticism. And nothing to do with how powerful it is. It is powerful. <laughs> now, when I returned to the Warhammer hobby three years ago now, there were some big differences between Age of Sigma and the previous Warhammer fantasy battle that I had been used to. One of them was that in fantasy battle, you had some units had special rules. You know, this, this, this is the special rule for this unit. Uh, or it might be a piece of special equipment like sea dragon cloaks for dark elf corsets. But many didn't. You know, a lot of units just had a points cost and some stats. They may distinguish themselves from other units uh, with different stats or just with different equipment, but the equipment was by and large a standard set, light armor, heavy armor, shield, halberd, great weapon, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it was all a standard list of equipment options common to other armies. And maybe they would have the odd special rule as well, but again, frequently from a common list like frenzy or stupidity or hatred. So the unit choices for an army were a mix of special cases, the word genuine special cases, but then a load of generic ones. In Age of Sigma, everything is a special case. You know, I would, when I came to the hobby, I would flick through the War Scrolls, uh, I had the, 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 the books of the Grand uh, Alliances, and every unit had its own special rules. That, that struck me, every single one. The problem with this aspect of games design is that you inevitably need to come up with unique rules. Often common special rules will crop up by different names. You know, some units can run in charge. Be called different things, but you know, that's a common one that crops up. Some will be minus one to be hit. It might be just in close combat, might be full stop. Some will be able to charge 3d6 and so on. You've got various ones like that. But you also want to come up with some really unique special rules for a few of the units in each battle tome at least. And because now you can't just distinguish your special units by just giving them some special rules like in Fancy Battle, you have to give them really special rules because even the chaff have special rules. And I suppose what we have now with the Lumineth Realm Lords is possibly the inevitable result of that. You know, we already had like Teclas, who has many casting options, including its cast, deal with it. Um, this is an example of what some people aren't keen on. You know, it's a rule that doesn't enhance your own army. That's generally what special rules do. They enhance your unit, your army. Um, what this does is takes agency away from your opponents. Now we get that some spellcasters are so powerful because they'll have plus one to cast plus two, plus three really sometimes, that unbinding their spells is going to be tricky. You know, if you've got Nagash on the table, you know he's getting some spells through. But Teclis can just deny you the option even. You know, you could have powerful anti-magic and it's like, no, no, I'm Teclis. You know, uh, we have with the new book, uh, Severith, who can just switch off enemy terrain. That's pretty huge against some armies. Like Nurgle, Ossi, like Bone Reapers, Iden of Deepkin, Seraphon, all have scenery where you would reasonably push it up the board. In other words, place it in each re easy reach of that character. Mind you, that character's got a hell of a reach. Um, and lose out quite badly from having its abilities switched off. Because when it comes to rules that enhance your own units, you know, that's fine. We get that. Some will be considered very powerful, <laughs> and then some people go, oh, it's a bit powerful there. Um, but they're not inherently fun sponges. It doesn't spoil the fun. But when you disable your opponent's special abilities, 
you know, you are taking away what makes their army special sometimes. And it can be that, that very opposite of fun to stop your opponent's army doing what they do. And, and that's without even talking about the power of some abilities. Like Aether Quartz, for example, was already very powerful. Yes, you can only use it once. Oh, well, usually you can only use it once. And you are restricted to one use per phase. But using them liberally early on in the battle can give you a stranglehold in the game. So it doesn't matter you won't have it available later on. You know, in theory, there's a downside because it costs you bravery. But this is often not a problem <laughs> because if you make use um, of your, your Cathalar, um, you know, you may be able to complete negate even that drawback and turn it into a drawback for your opponent. So it's like, all right, I'm going to add plus one to my save rolls here to deny you some kills. But I normally would get minus one to bravery, you know, to balance it out there. But actually, do you know what? For a laugh, I'm going to make you take the bravery penalty instead. Are you going to roll for it? No, no, I'm just, <laughs> you're just minus one bravery, mate. For the rest of the battle, you know, that's what we're going to do. Um, but Lumineth are also an army that have solutions to every problem in Age of Sigma. Now, that's not to say you can jam them all into one 2,000 point army. You can't have everything. No army can have everything. But you can build pretty much whatever sort of list you want. You know, you can build a list that can close with your opponent immediately. The standard thing in Age of Sigma is to try, if you get the choice of who goes first, try and give your opponent the first turn, if you get the decision, so you can have a crack at getting the, the, the notorious double turn. But that's, you know, uh, based on the notion that most armies can't do much in the first turn. But Lumineth can be built so that you take an awful risk by getting them to go first. You know, if getting to objectives and being hard to shift is more your thing, well, you can build a different army. You can build one that can get to the objective and just basically stay there, be like a, like a block of stone. If you want to design an army based on ranged attacks, yeah, got that. Strong close combat force, yep, yeah, got that too. And it's not just that it can do these things. Stormcast Eternals can do all of those things. You can build a list around all of those things as well. It's that Lumineth Realm Lords can do it very well. Now, you could argue, well, actually, this is the model, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if all armies had such flexibility? Let people choose the army that has the aesthetic that, they, that most appeals to them so that we can genuinely say when choosing a new army, just pick the one you like the look of, and then they can build it in the style that they like. Yes, absolutely. But the thing is that this is not the case for most other armies. Perhaps any other army to the same extent, as I say, Stormcast Eternals can have any type of army. They've got the range for it. It's not always strong, you know. So as such, Lumineth, you could argue, stands out in this regard. Now, of course, the game is played for fun at the end of the day. Fun can be subjective, which is why I say this is not something that is objectively bad. People reasonably want to feel that they have a chance to win in a game. Yeah, OK. Uh, some people don't find a game fun unless they win easily. In fact, they'll only be um, happy. They'll be in constant search of the army that lets them win easily without having to learn strategy themselves. They will hunt down the most overpowered lists emerging from tournaments and then wonder why they're not winning with them. Must be the dice. But I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who just want to be in with a shout. Doesn't matter if they win or lose as long as they had a chance and have fun. In terms of power, this is a top tier army. It was before <laughs> and it's now enhanced because it hasn't lost some things and gained others. It has just gained. Want to use it like it was before? Go ahead and do that. But the extra units and options now aren't just an expansion for interest. You know, it's not just that they've been fleshed out with a load of stuff that ultimately you wouldn't actually take. They will be making it onto the top tables of future tournaments as well, wherever they may be played, which isn't actually going to be here for a while. But you can still beat it, of course, especially at the more casual le uh, level of gaming clubs. You don't really worry too much about the meta there because um, you don't really get dominant armies playing it on a casual basis. But is it fun to play against when your own rules are being shut down? Now, that's the question. And for those who don't really like enemy armies that null zone you, there is a problem with Lumineth now. I mean, you just look at the law of the winds. First spell, stop an enemy unit from being able to run. 
Second spell, stop an enemy unit being able to benefit from command abilities. And not, so you have a command ability that your army works on. No, you're not using that. Another spell has a chance of preventing them from moving, charging, or piling in. Another one makes enemy command abilities cost an extra command point. And this isn't like in 40k where you've got a big handful. It's like, oh no, that's a bit annoying. That's, that's devastating in Age of Sigma. Some other armies have the odd rule that does the same thing. Has to be said, you know, people will point to, oh, what about this arm? What about this? What about this? Some other armies have the odd rule that denies your opponent some agency. Thing with Lumineth is there's a hell of a lot of them. The only thing making me think we are not going to see too many of those spells, for example, is the fact that there are a hell of a lot of stunningly destructive ones available as well. And even Teclis can only cast so many. So as I read the extra stuff in the new battle turn or Broken Realms, wherever you got it from, I can say that they are fun. I still think they're fun. You can make some very fun lists with Lumineth Realm Lords. Um, they absolutely remain on my list of armies to get done. I've got a hell of a list. Uh, they're not at the very top, <laughs> but they're, you know, middling. Uh, to play upon against rather, now it can depend. It is strong, but you know, Disciples of Saints are strong, Cowardron Overlords are strong. And I've been happy to play against both of those frequently. Uh, not this year, <laughs> not in the last year in fact, but beforehand. And as overpowered rules go, I'm going to have to say there's nothing in the Lumineth book that is as brainless as a spell that lets you bring back D6 four wound models as existed before the Zinch update. But I could also see people making lists that will just shut you down. And I don't mean provide a strong counter against. There is often a sense of paper, rock, scissors in Warhammer and always has been. But actually shut you down in terms of removing a significant chunk of the flavour of your own army. And I can see that as being not that much fun for some people. And sure, as I said, you'll find examples of the same sorts of rules in most battle towns. But it's just that sheer number of them. You know, people will say when they're going, ah, well, what about this or what about that? And it's like you're picking on a unit in a battle town. There's a massive list of them for Lumineth. And I think that's what has people alarmed. But the basic issue is one that I think is a core feature of Age of Sigma. You know, perhaps the revamped fantasy battle coming in the future will not have this feature. But like I said, I think this is essentially a consequence of deciding that each separate unit should have special rules. Which means that even when the, the basic grunts have special rules, the elites need very special rules. And there's only so many things you can think of before you have to start going for the crazy. And I guess this policy came about because Age of Sigma originally, I wasn't in the hobby at the time, I'd, I'd left the hobby and I've came back since, but it originally had the plan, isn't it, of basically not needing army books, just download the War Scrolls for free, bring a bucket of models and chuck them on the table and away you go. But to sell the models, you needed each unit to look appealing on that War Scroll. It was no good just being a stat stick. That's not good, I'm not buying them. I'll get the ones with the special rules. And I think that's what we're seeing now, which won't be a problem for everyone. And I don't want to over egg it myself. I've, I'd never not play someone because of the army they have, because of my perceptions about it. Um, and as I say, I intend to get my own at some point, maybe next year. By which time, I guess we'll be on to their third battle turn with even more unit choices than the Sigmarines by now. But there you go. Uh, thanks very much for listening. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And until next time, I'll see you later.